feel I was given quite a big topic. Um, each of the different uh, speakers have uh, a number of different things to cover, and I'm pleased that there's a lot of overlap between the different talks. If I'm running out of time to completely go over the Canadian CLL treatment guidelines, which I was also asked to uh, cover briefly, because that's a, a, a new uh, activity that we, that we uh, participated with Lymphoma Canada in trying to create some pan-Canadian recommendations for first-line treatment, and I was asked to try to touch on that. So that adds to my talk. If I can't cover all of that, then obviously treatment is being addressed more, more completely in other talks. So we can always hurry along if we need to stay on time. So, so I'm trying to, to focus in a bit of a Canadian way, and I do recognize that um, from a Canadian perspective, most of the population is in Ontario and Quebec, and so this um, meeting is probably predominantly more from Eastern Canada. And my Western Canadian bias is still, I, I think, uh, over-compassable because uh, I am able also to recognize uh, what options are available in different provinces, and I'm actually from Ontario. Interestingly, Graham and I are both from Sault Ste. Marie, and we went to the same high school, so that is... <laughs> Um, so uh, I have some disclosures in that I have participated in a number of clinical trials and hopefully that doesn't bias my approach to different drugs and to different uh, tests and yet I still want to recognize that, uh, uh, that participation with industry. So we're going to review some, um, just briefly, the diagnosis in terms of a Canadian perspective and then um, uh, my perspective on prognostic testing. So Dr. Lamana already touched on uh, really the key to diagnosis, but I just wanted to, to clarify for people some of the, the what, what flow cytometry really means. So we can get a basic <coughs> blood test that includes white count and the, and the number of lymphocytes as well as red cells and uh, platelets, but the flow cytometry is a special test that your physician has to order um, uh, on its own. And it's not a test that we would do routinely, and it's not a test that we would repeat routinely, um, but it really just allows us to enumerate individual cells and to look at the different proteins on the surface of the cell, which helps us see how many of them have that CLL appearance, where they look like a B cell, but they have this CD5 protein, which doesn't belong in a B cell. So that's how you can tell these are CLL cells, because they have a, a, a separate protein from your normal B cells. What is important is that the diagnostic criteria now requires us to have sufficient number of those cells to be called CLL. And there are a number of people, maybe even people in this room, who were told that they had CLL years ago, where nowadays we might not call that CLL. We might call that this MBL, or monoclonal B-cell lymphocytosis, which is the same appearance of cells, but not enough of them to now meet the diagnostic criteria. And the reason they change the diagnostic criteria is because some people who have such a low level never progress over their lifetime. And so we didn't want to label people as having leukemia, some of whom really just had a few funny cells in their blood that weren't hurting them and were never going to hurt them. Um, so this is very hard for me to see. I feel bad. I, try, I, I obviously removed all the patient characteristics, but I'm trying to show you in, in Calgary how our reporting has changed. So on the right, that's an example of a patient with CLL, and you can't really read the numbers, but down at the bottom is a percentage that they used to provide of this abnormal uh, population of cells. So that wasn't enough information, and after they changed the diagnostic criteria, we had to go to our lab and say, you need to give us a number, right? Because if the patient has a lymphocyte count of seven or eight, and they need to have more than five of this clonal B cell population. Do they? Don't they? How do we know? And so now, you can't, again, I'm sorry, you can't really read this very well, but now we actually get a number, and the number here is 3.28 on this, say, report, for example. So the patient on the left has MBL. They have the same population appearance of cells, but they don't have enough of them to be called CLL. And I think that's really important because in some labs, uh, they just say CLL-like cells present. And it's not nice for patients to come in, having been told by their referring physician, I'm sending you to a hematologist because the, 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 the blood test says you have leukemia. And then you get there and they say, well, you don't actually have leukemia. You have this pre-leukemia condition. It's important for you to realize that um, some of those patients will never develop CLL. Why do you get it? And we, we just don't know. Um, there's a whole bunch of different factors, um, but, but 
that we can't tell you why this happened to you. All we can say is it doesn't appear as though there's anything an individual person does or doesn't do that makes this happen. So there's no lifestyle markers that we know have led you to get this disease. So in terms of prognostic markers, I think it's important to recognize what a prognostic marker is as, as opposed to a predictive marker. So a prognostic marker is more reflective of the disease itself um, and it, it, it has an impact on, let's say, outcome like survival that is not necessarily influenced by what we do to you. Um, whereas a predictive marker might be a test that we can do that it will uh, change your outcome if we give you different treatments. So something that we could, in a sense, almost uh, alter our decision making based on. So as physicians in a publicly funded healthcare system, we really need to know anything that is a predictive factor. Because if it's something that, let's say you have this marker, and if we give you one treatment, you do really poorly, and if we give you another treatment, you do really well, then we need that predictive factor information to decide which treatment to recommend to you. If there's a prognostic marker, which, you know, irrespective of what we offer you, your outcome, let's say, isn't gonna be that great, well, some people say it's very important for a patient to know that. It is, and yet there's nothing we can do about it. If there's nothing we can do about it, sometimes just getting bad news is actually impairing your quality of life. It doesn't actually help you. And when we're advocating for tests and looking for the government to help us pay for tests, that test is less important to us. As physicians, if, it's not, if there's nothing we can do about it and we're not gonna change our management based on it, and it costs money, then I'm not going to ask them to pay for that test. I'm going to ask them to pay for the other test, the one that helped me decide which treatment to give you, that had a difference for outcome, right? So it is important to remember when we talk about prognostic markers that some tests may one day become clearly important in terms of prognosis, and we may never get access to those tests, or at least not routinely. And if it doesn't change, if it's not predictive, then maybe that's not such a big loss. I'd rather the money we have in our healthcare system goes to getting the drugs to the right people, rather than necessarily giving us every bit of information for individual patients, which has its own value, but there's always a decision. There, there, there is only so much money in the pot, and we have to choose where we're allocating it. So here's just a, a broad list of prognostic factors that are pretty much the big ones that most of you will have heard of, or if you haven't, you, you know, I think that, that it's important to know, and we'll talk about them. The first one is stage. So uh, stage is actually one of the biggest predictors for um, survival, and it's decided when you're first diagnosed. Um, uh, this beta-2 microglobulin is a simple blood test. It's not that expensive, um, but it's mostly predictive uh, before you start treatment, um, somewhat prognostic at diagnosis. Uh, following it over time, we don't really know how useful that is, so most of the time it's not repeated. Flow cytometry has some special kinds of extra information they can get about proteins on the surface of the cell, and some of these tests, the CD38 and ZAP70, were very popular years ago, but they've proven to not be quite so reliable, so they're not really routinely used, and I wouldn't be recommending that we start looking at them too carefully. Um, cytogenetics is the chromosomal abnormalities within the leukemia cells, where FISH is just a way of looking for those changes, and um, those are very important in terms of uh, some of them being predictive. The mutation status of the immunoglobulin, so the CLL cells are B cells, and B cells make, normal B cells make antibodies. So these CLL cells have a, they make a start to make an antibody, like a normal B cell would, and part of the maturation of a B cell is to develop these mutations so that you can help target different, let's say, bacterial invaders. So even this leukemia cell, which isn't useful, isn't doing anything, some of them still have these mutations on them, which implies that they were sort of a later level of development before they became the cancer. So having mutations sounds funny, because you would think that sounds bad, mutation sounds bad, but actually having mutations is good, because it means that the cell, um, the CLL cell came from a sort of more mature progenitor. Not having mutations means it came from a more immature part of the development, and that's not as good. 
Um, and then there's a number of different genes within our DNA and within the DNA of the leukemia cells that can get individual mutations, so we're back to the same term, um, which can be usually bad, but not well enough uh, confirmed, I would say, that we should be doing those tests routinely. And then back to what Dr. Lamana said, that really the tempo of your own disease is the biggest predictor for how things are going to go. And that's the old-fashioned lymphocyte doubling time, which probably 20 years ago was the only prognostic factor we had, was just looking at people and saying, okay, now I've watched you for two years, and your lymphocyte count hasn't changed over that two years. Odds are you're going to do pretty well. Versus the person whose lymphocyte count is doubled every three months, you know, you can tell that their, that their disease is clearly much more aggressive and um, uh, pro proliferative. So the staging, there's two different staging methods of which in North America we pretty much all use this rye staging, so most people have a, known their rye stage, um, but Binet is a different staging system used in, in Europe, so many of the people here from France would have a Binet stage. Binet is actually simpler, I'm not sure why we haven't uh, uh, all unified our staging, but we like to stick with our rye staging, where zero just means you only have lymphocytes, but all the way up to stages three and four um, where you've got bone marrow problems, so you're not making your red cells or your platelets sufficient enough to have normal blood counts. So this is a, uh, I don't know if you can see the, the citation well at the bottom, this is um, curves of survival, overall survival on the left and progression-free survival on the right that come from an uh, uh, education book from 2006. And if you look at those curves and you actually look down at the bottom, you see some 15, 25, 30 years. So in, in, the, low, in, the, in, the, in the Binet A, there's, some, there's you know, quite a few people going out many years. But if you're looking at the, at the B and, and C, you're thinking to yourself, oh my goodness, those aren't great survivals. Um, and it, it's really hard now to find modern survival curves. This, was a 2006 publication. This data came from before that. This is before all of the new drugs. So when I see patients in my clinic now, and I'm trying to guesstimate their survival when they're newly diagnosed with CLL, I have no idea. Um, this data is actually the, the most recent data I can find. It comes from a big US um, intergroup data. And all I can, all I can say is the, the, the numbers at the bottom 10, 20, 30, 40. So you're looking at um, uh, months, not years now. So it's not going out as far, 60 at the end, meaning just five years. But look at how far up those curves are. So stage is still important. This, the, 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 the rise stage zero patients are still doing the best because their survival is staying high, not that many patients dropping off and dying over time. Um, it, but we don't know uh, a 50%. So now, with this data, this modern data, we can say that patients, that stage still has an impact on telling you that you'll live, how long you'll live, but we don't know how long to guess on average people will live nowadays with a new diagnosis of CLL. We can just say it's much better, those curves are much higher up, less people falling off over time than what we saw in my curves from 2006. This is a representation of the outcomes by different cytogenetic group, those chromosome abnormalities. Just reminding you of how clear, clear the differences in survival are. So this is a survival, um, when we look at survival curves, uh, if, a, if nobody was dying, everybody would stay on a straight line up here at 100%, right? 100% of people surviving. Every time a patient on the curve dies for an overall survival curve, it drops down a bit. So this curve here that goes down quite precipitously is the patients with the deletion 17P. These curves, again, are before any of the new agents. This was the data that first showed us that these chromosome changes had impact. Um, and this was before any of the new drugs. So when we started to get these new drugs that seemed to work so much better, we thought at first that these chromosomes didn't matter anymore. So maybe we didn't really have to be checking them so often. But this is curves from the new um, ibrutinib uh, uh, information, so this is in the relapse setting. And although that curve is much less precipitous, this is still the deletion 17Ps where clearly you're losing more patients over time 
than you are in the ones in the other two arms. The, the, this is the deletion 11 Qs, and this is the patients who don't have either. So, so having these chromosome changes is still bad even with the new drugs. It's just significantly less bad, and um, these drugs still work really well. For the mutation of the anti immunoglobulin, this is just a representation of the antibody that the B cell makes. And as I was mentioning, this is the little area where you can imagine a normal antibody has to try to, to target something. Let's say there's an invader, there's a bacteria in your body. So your antibody wants to latch onto it to help your body's immune system target that and kill it. And so this is the area where, your, where mutations happen to try to modify this antibody so that it latches on better to whatever it's targeting. So in CLL, if the CLL cell was more mature, it has mutations in this region because it came from this more mature um, uh, progenitor. So this was the first data. This is, this is a publication from 1999. So how far back are we going? When they showed that if you had a mutation versus you didn't, that your survival, again, was significantly better and your time to first treatment was significantly longer. Clearly, these were two different populations of patients. They were almost like two different diseases separating out. Um, so they knew that a long time ago, but they didn't really know what to do about it, and the test wasn't really easy to do. So despite the fact that we knew about that information, Nobody was really doing the test. They were doing it in research labs. It was kind of always in, in a clinical trial. You would know which of the, which, you know, that there was however many patients in each of the two groups. But most doctors never knew for their individual patients who was in one group and who was in another. And we weren't using that information to make any kind of treatment decisions. So as I was saying before, if it just told you that one group was doing worse and one group was doing better, but it didn't have any impact on what we were doing, then it was kind of academic interest that didn't really matter in a sense. Now, the new data that has come out is uh, in reference to FCR, so fludarabine, cyclophosphamide, and rituximab, which treatment, individual treatments haven't been discussed so much yet, but obviously we're going to talk more about treatment, but that is the standard treatment for first-time therapy for young, fit patients. And the first data for this FCR came from the MD Anderson, where MD Anderson is a referral center, you know, uh, one of the um, pri a private cancer clinic where people can go if they have enough money, as well as people who live nearby. So there's obviously a bit of selection in the patients who tend to go and be treated there. Um, and so these are, the, but these were the first 300 patients they ever treated with this regimen, highly motivated people. This is the curve here for progression-free survival, meaning if, remember what I said, if 100% of people are staying well, the curve's gonna be up here. Well, 100% of people aren't staying well, but there's this little, plat there's this obvious plateau in the curve. So after you lose a few people to relapses, there appears to be a group of patients where maybe they're not actually ever going to relapse because the curve is now flattened out and time is going past. The, the, this is 15 years down here, so there's, 50% of people, more than that actually, um, in this curve, about 60% of people in that arm who are mutated immunoglobulin, who got FCR, who haven't had a relapse yet, and you're out towards 15 years. So we never talked about cure in CLL before, but that's pretty good proximity. If your disease isn't gonna come, if 20 years has gone by and you haven't had your disease come back yet, we can't tell you for sure you're cured, but we're starting to feel pretty confident that this has certainly made a big difference to, the t to, to your life, and possibly you're never seeing your disease again. We'll never be able to say cure until, we, until sufficient people have lived out a normal life expectancy and died of their normal life expectancy before we could actually say, okay, this is a, you know, a cure. This is just the data from the uh, big German CLL study that looked at this FCR uh, and showing the same thing, uh, but just with a little bit less long follow-up, but the that, that the patients with this mutated immunoglobulin are truly doing um, very well and looking like they may have a cure. So what about gene mutations? There's a whole bunch of them, and all I can say is that um, there's still debate from the literature. One study will say this mutation is predicts for bad outcome. Another study will say, in our group, we couldn't see that statistically. 
Whenever there's question, and tests aren't easy to do and they're not cheap, I don't think we should be doing them until we know for sure. But also, uh, it doesn't look as though any of these mutations have yet been predicted to say that if we know you have it, you should get one treatment or you should get another. So I don't think yet that uh, we would be advocating in Canada to be doing most of these mutations as a part of our prognostic testing. This is the CLL International Prognostic Index, and this is the largest uh, g validated uh, prognostic study that we have. So uh, they took a very large group of patients and they looked at their different factors that had been reported as being prognostic. Um, and then they looked to see which proved to still be, pro to be prognostic in their group. And then they looked at a whole bunch of other po patient populations, one group from the Mayo Clinic, one group that was their own sort of internal validation, one group from Scandinavia. So patients may be treated a little bit differently, maybe slightly genetically different, you know, different sort of racial groups, that kind of thing. Um, and they came out with all the same information where this uh, TP53 abnormalities was, was the strongest predictor and then you have mutation status, beta-2 microglobulin, stage, and age. So T the reason it says TP53 status instead of saying deletion 17P, which is how we assess for, for TP53 in Canada, is because there's two different ways that you can have a problem with the TP53 gene. You can either lose a part of it, which is what deletion of 17P means. That gene is on the short arm of chromosome 17. If you lose a, break a piece off of that chromosome and the gene is within it, now it's gone. Now you're missing a copy of that gene. You could also just take the gene and end up with a DNA mutation within the gene. So finding mutations within the gene is a lot harder because it's quite a big gene. So you have to look at the DNA for a large section of DNA to look and see if there's a change in the DNA. So mutation and assessment has proven in studies to be just as important as deletion 17P. If you, don't, if you have the chromosome, but there's a mutation in the gene, that's just as bad as missing the piece of the chromosome. But it's harder to test for, and it costs more. So in Canada, we don't do it. But modern testing is getting better and we know that we should be doing it. So whether you have a mutation or you have a loss of the gene, it means the same thing. Um, and some people only have one and some people have the other and some people have both. So really we should be doing both tests and that's what this, this really strong predictor saying that it's a, a hazard ratio of four. Having the mutation or having the loss means you're four times more likely to do poorly. It's a very, it's very strong predictor and it's very important that we have that test, but it's not something that's easy to get right now. This is just curves. I think it's a, um, showing you that from that CLL IPI, if you looked at all of these different factors and you separate the patients out, it's very easy to see clear survival separations. Having 17P problem or TP53 mutation, being older, unfortunately you don't live as long when you're older to start with, uh, having high stage, you know, these things. If you have lots of these factors, you're not going to live as long as if you have very few of them. I don't want to try to encourage us by other people's problems, but I think that, one, that uh, a big qualm we have as Canadians is that we are somehow um, not having access to as good of options, let's say, as we would if we were in the U.S. And certainly in a lot of U.S. centers, um, these prognostic factors are done more routinely, more frequently, more easily than in many Canadian centers. Um, this is real-world data from 199 U.S. centers. Data collected between 2010 and 2014, recent data, only looking at patients who were on therapy, okay? In Canada, I'd, I don't recommend that people have prognostic testing done at diagnosis. I recommend you have it done when you need treatment because we know that as many as half of patients with CLL may never need treatment. They could be in the good group. So knowing this information doesn't change our management because you might have never needed management, you might have never needed treatment for your CLL at all, but these tests cost money. So we want to use them when they help us. So you want to use them when you need treatment. If you have testing for deletion 17P at diagnosis and you don't need treatment for 10 years, 
by the time you need treatment, we need to do that test again, because you might not have had the deletion 17P 10 years ago, but you may now have it now. So having done the test 10 years ago didn't help us. Um, although the mutation, immunoglobulin mutation study testing doesn't change, so you could only need to do it once in your lifetime, you still don't need it if you're never going to need treatment. So again, we recommend that you do it when you're getting close to needing treatment. But this is data from the US for patients on treatment, and only 58% of patients had some kind of genetic uh, fish testing. We're recommending that everybody has assessment for that deletion 17P, and I think in our centers in Canada, we're doing quite well. Most patients are having this test done, 58%. In the US, many of these were academic centers, but many of them were just their sort of private treatment clinics. Um, down here, this is just showing you um, the, the, the first, uh, that's a line of therapy. So first line of therapy, second line of therapy. By the time you get to second line of therapy, 54% of patients didn't know anything about their genetics. So actually, it was more common to do it once. They didn't even repeat it. Um, the immunoglobulin mutation testing, only done in 6.4% of patients. So don't feel bad if you don't know this information about yourself. You are not being cheated out of decent care. We're getting better. We're doing it more often. But it's not like this is routinely done everywhere and you're the only one who hasn't had it done. It's actually not been commonly available in most places. I'm going to go very quickly through this because I was asked to address the Canadian CLL guidelines. And I just wanted to say that um, this was work done not by myself, even if I'm the first author. It's Elizabeth Lai, who's here somewhere from Lymphoma Canada, did all of this work. <laughs> there she is. Uh, it's a very well written um, pa paper looking at all of the, the good quality evidence um, studies for CLL. We just answer, we tried to answer a bunch of questions related to frontline treatment. So. What prognostic testing should we be doing? Should everybody be doing? Um, how should we assess patient fitness? Uh, how should early stage CLL without symptoms be treated? How should advanced stage patients be treated? And then which patients need more than just one treatment? They need some sort of maintenance. Um, so I've already covered prognostic um, testing. We don't think prognostic testing should be routinely done unless you need treatment. And when you need treatment, we think you need, should have both deletion 17P and TP53 mutation testing. We think we should be doing mutational status in patients who would be eligible for FCR. It's an important information for you to know whether you should get the FCR. And we don't think that there's enough data to tell us we should be doing anything else routinely right now in terms of gene mutations. Um, there's Fitness assessments of patients is a good idea, but there's no data to tell us how we should be doing that. So if you've got lots of medical problems, you shouldn't get such strong treatment, but we believe that doctors should be assessing that, but we're not going to tell them how to do it. Um, how should asymptomatic patients be treated? This is mostly uh, this is a complicated uh, uh, table, but suffice it to say, there's still no data to say that if you have bad prognostic factors and you don't have symptoms, that you should be treated for your CLL. We actually still think that if you're asymptomatic without sort of anemia or thrombocytopenia, that you can just be watched and that that is the best approach currently. I'm going to go very quickly through how should um, symptomatic patients be treated because that's gonna be covered by other people, but we still think that you should get uh, FCR if you're young and fit without a TP53 problem but you should be getting uh, one of the new targeted drugs like ibrutinib if you actually have a TP53 mutation. Um, and we think that if, you, if you're not fit enough and strong enough to get FCR, that you can get this BR or bendamustine or rituximab uh, because that's what the strongest data suggests. Um, this is the curves that tell us that FCR sur improves survival. And this is a curve that tells us that FCR is still better than this bendamustine or rituximab. But Bendamustine rituximab works quite well, and in patients who are over 65, there's a lot less toxicity. It's a lot, a lot easier to take, and it doesn't seem like there's a difference in the two groups because you can't really get FCR properly if you're too old. So if you're older, getting this bendamustine rituximab is an appropriate um, replacement for getting FCR. This is just the toxicity data. 50% of patients who tried to get FCR who were over 65 had to be admitted to hospital for an infection. It's not very nice. Most people don't want to go to hospital for infection on their chemo. That's a scary thought. Um, 
I won't talk too much about this, but in Ontario, a lot of people have had FR or fludarabine and rituximab only, or in BC, and that was a very popular regimen. But just suffice it to say, they did do a study, and it proved not to be um, as good as FCR. For older patients, we have a couple different options: chlorambucil with uh, with obinutuzumab, which is a new antibody, or ibrutinib. Um, the ibrutinib study showed that, uh, that progressions were much less common when you get this ibrutinib, this new drug, front line, but the, and there was an overall survival advantage, but it was compared against a very weak comparator, a chemo drug all on its own that is not how we would treat people. Um, and uh, although there was an overall survival difference, the patients weren't, were, were uh, on the chlorambucil arm didn't really get to get that new drug because of the way the study was done. The crossover was a bit complicated. So I'm not sure, uh, I, I, we don't know which one is better. And so our opinion is that we can't tell you whether you should be getting chlorambucil and abinutuzumab as an older patient or whether you should be getting ibrutinib frontline. But I, think, I still think the study should be done. And I think cost-wise, the antibody chemo combination is more cost-effective for a publicly funded healthcare system. And then there's no data to give anything as maintenance afterwards. And that's it. Hi, I have a question about Richter's. Um, what's the next treatment if it comes back, or is there any hope? So Richter's is really a different disease, right? So patients who have a, an underlying lymphoma or leukemia that's slower growing have this chance of developing a more aggressive lymphoma, which is what Richter's is. Um, and so the treatments are not the same as CLL, and if you get the, unfortunately, um, most patients with Richter's have quite a, a resistant disease. It's hard to, it's hard to cure, um, but there's a population of patients who actually do quite well, like other patients with aggressive lymphoma in the first place. So if you have Richter's and you get chemo and you get a really good response and, it's, and the disease is gone, we usually recommend a stem cell transplant for people who are young enough to have it. If you can't, then we just sort of cross our fingers and hope. Um, but usually, if the disease was going to come back, unfortunately, it comes back very quickly. Um, and our treatments are not great at that time. So if it doesn't come back, and it's, it's actually, there's a group of patients who, who really surprise us. We all have in our practice people who are beyond five years after having treatment for Richter's without a transplant, and those patients are likely cured of that aggressive lymphoma. Uh, hello, Dr. Owen. Uh, I, my question has to do with treatment anxiety under two contexts. Uh, the first context is first-line treatment. And um, after listening to you, uh, I know that there is a divergence of opinion among experts. Leaving aside drug accessibility and cost, uh, I happen to be one patient who is out on an early trial of ibrutinib, and I'm six years and almost 10 months, and I would be dead if it weren't for that drug. Now, that's a data point of one. Patients have to make decisions based on large statistical data. But I have not seen anything, and maybe there exists something, to go to an individual patient that is young uh, and fit and say, you are eligible for the best treatment that we know of, uh, FCR, for all the reasons that you have given. However, we are looking at a patient population broadly that is expected to achieve much longer overall survival um, and that increases the risks from the toxicity of FCR treatment in the long run. And the young and fit patients are patients who are actually, uh, those patients with indolent disease are the ones that are statistically uh, doing very well on drugs like kinase inhibitors. So I was just wondering if, uh, if you could comment on how you square that rationale. Most people didn't have mutation testing of the immunoglobulin in Canada. It's very newly available. So um, we really, we offered patients FCR 
who are young and fit without knowing if they were in that group that we thought might potentially be cured. And it's obvious who isn't because the patients who are not in that cured group do have their disease recur within a few years. Not immediately, but usually three, four, five years later. And so you don't wait that long to see the patients who are going to need additional therapies. Nowadays, we know that those patients are probably in that, in that unmutated group. The, 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 the truth is we don't have any good studies of using ibrutinib or other new targeted treatments frontline in young fit patients. And it's purely because the, the studies are still going. Um, in part, it's because FCR works well for patients. And if you want to prove that another drug works better, it's obviously going to take longer to show that if your comparator arm you wanna, is doing really so. well, right? Um, proving that ibrutinib could work just as well is not enough for us because as us, as a, as, a, as a country, you're talking about funding a new therapy. So if ibrutinib that continues until progression could work just as well as FCR, but 60% of patients in the good risk group of FCR are cured and get six months of treatment with sort of cheaper older drugs and then get nothing, the cost effectiveness discussion is, well, there's no discussion. The, the, the cost differences would be so phenomenal that the, the, the provinces just wouldn't be willing to pay for it. So we need to prove that the new, more expensive drugs are, are better before we change. Um, and then that takes more time, right? So today, I, I think that getting FCR for a young, fit patient, particularly those with the mutated immunoglobulin, really is a, it's an excellent treatment. It, it has an end, it's a, it's a, it's a six-month therapy, and then some of those patients are never going to need next treatment, or not for, for over a decade. Um, there are risks of long-term toxicities, but there's risks of long-term risks of second cancers just from having CLL that's not even treated. Um, so you can't, you know, I think that you, you have to be cognizant of, of the, the, the longer-term risks, but you have to also think about what patients are gaining to be able to have their life back without taking a drug every day, um, without having to worry about that. Um, I have a question about how often cytogenetic testing should be done. Many of us are patients who have been treated and relapsed perhaps several times over 15 or 20 or even 25 years. Um, how often should the, this testing be done? And in fact, in Canada, how often is it done? So our recommendation is that the testing be done every time you start a new therapy. However, if we knew you have deletion 17P, and we're kind of looking for deletion 17P, I would say there's really no point repeating the test. If you've got it, you, you can't get it again. I mean, you've already got it, right? Um, if, if you're at a, a line of therapy where there's no choices, again, the test does cost money. So if you are you know, not able to, to take ibrutinib, let's say, because you've stopped it because you have bad side effects or now it's not working for you anymore, and we really only have venetoclax as the next drug out there. I don't see how doing the cytogenetics is going to, you know, you, you've got a drug, and so it doesn't matter what your cytogenetics show, that's the only drug we have to offer you. Um, and sometimes more information isn't good. If you, if you didn't have deletion 17P before, but now things, you know, things are not looking good and you only have one more treatment option, does getting that news that you fall in that category actually help you? It probably doesn't. Um, so I don't recommend doing it every single line of therapy. I recommend doing it first line of therapy and then um, planning to do it at every subsequent line, but thinking about it and not doing it if it's not needed. And I think that in a lot of centers, people sort of forget after the first line because most patients are being offered ibrutinib as their next treatment. And although there is data to show that you're, you're likely to have less long a remission if you have the deletion 17P when you start your ibrutinib, if you're starting it regardless, then some doctors would kind of say, well, it's not changing anything. So I don't think it's routinely done for all subsequent lines of therapy, but I don't necessarily think that's wrong. I think if you are really well informed and you know it makes a difference to you and you really want the information, you should ask because it's probably available in some places, but there are some physicians who, who I, you know, I'm saying pragmatically say, it's not gonna change what I'm gonna do. 
And I always say, everybody wants the good news, but nobody wants the bad news. And if you test it, you can't only disclose the good news, right? So you have to tell people if they've got the bad news result. So sometimes it's better not to do the test if the discussion is going to make people more unhappy by the result, right? So you have to talk to your doctor, I think, and make sure you're clear. If it's really important to you, you really want it, you probably have to ask for subsequent lines of therapy in a lot of centers. Among your many excellent graphs, I noticed the one where the mutated group has an LD50 of about 10 years, and then it just seems to level off. Uh, has anyone checked to see if the reason for the die-off of half the number is because of advanced age, or have you corrected for that? So, so there's more patients in the mutated group who will never get treatment than in the unmutated group, um, and actually it's at least half. So when you start off um, in a sort of in a clinic and you just if you were just to see new CLL patients and treat it and, and test everybody, I think it's about. Almost 70% of patients have mutated immunoglobulin. But when you look at clinical trials, it's always more patients with unmutated. You know, 60% and then 70% of relapse because it's the unmutated patients who need treatment and who need next treatment. And you know, so you get, you keep sort of selecting for those patients in the studies. So when you look at the mutated group, the reason that it's sort of leveling off is because some people are never getting treatment, but they are dying of other things. Yeah, I'm just wondering what the, the half that died off before the 10 years was up, if there was any common factor. No, and it is, you know, if you, if you need treatment, the, the treatment responses are better in the mutated group, but there's still people with mutated immunoglobulins who do poorly. It, you know, it's not like it's a perfect selection. Why are chromosomes five and six men? Oh, so, chrom so why, are, why aren't chromosomes five and six men? It's a very good question. We have 22 chromosomes plus X and Y. It's just that the ones that are mentioned are the only ones that are um, recurrent abnormalities in, those, in, in this kind of leukemia. So chromosome seven, for example, is very important in acute leukemia. Um, there's a lot of different, chrom you know, chromosome 21 is the Down syndrome chromosome. It's just that when they look at CLL, um, they saw these recurrent abnormalities in different patients who are not related to each other, not in your genes, just in the genes of the CLL, and that clearly is related to the disease, not to the person. And so those are the recurrent changes, just these few different chromosomes. All the other chromosomes, they look normal in, all, in, in the leukemia, and they just don't seem to be impacted in this specific disease. Uh, I just have one quick question, but it's actually for Dr. Lamana. Um, Dr. Lamana, you had a screen up there that said that uh, the new, live, uh, new dead vaccine for Shingrix uh, was good for people who aren't on treatment. What about someone who is on treatment? Yeah, it's a very good question. I didn't mean to separate the two. Um, uh, actually, obviously, for I think all patients, whether they've gotten treatment or not, you know, uh, uh, just like we recommend pneumonia and influenza vaccine, I think those folks should, should absolutely consider getting Shingrits as well. Folks, what we can't, what we lack, now remember this new vaccine actually wasn't tested on patients yet that are immunosuppressed. And so we have no data on how well this vaccine works in our patient population. Um, that doesn't mean it does it. We just have no idea, you know, how well you're going to make antibodies against this vaccine. So there is a notion. So I have to tell you, I'm pretty conservative. Um, and so if I have patients that have actually had zoster, um, I recommend lifelong prophylaxis. That's me. That's not everybody. So, you know, you have to, I think, have this discussion with your physician. Uh, for those of my folks who have had shingles that have been particularly, for those of you who might have had it and it was particularly nasty, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so I think this is something that um, certainly do I think now that we have this and we get more data over time about how well this works in our patient population? Absolutely. Do I think all folks should get it? Sure. Hopefully we can get more data about how effective it is in patients that are untreated versus previously or multiply relapse CLL patients. We just don't have the data available. So I have no problems with folks uh, absolutely getting this, this vaccine. But for, for those folks who are on treatment and have had shingles, um, you know, prophylaxis is still a very strong consideration. I actually want to make a couple of comments for, for the, the earlier folks who asked questions. The one about Richters. Now, now you know, I want to separate. There are two populations of Richters. 
Um, 90% of folks who have had Richter's are previously treated patients with CLL, um, and 10% are those who have never had any treatment of CLL. Those are the folks who typically do well, are the ones who have never had treatment for their CLL and then go on to get therapy for their large cell lymphoma per se, and usually typically do well. Richter's is, you know, just like the 17P was an unmet population, this is certainly a group that we do abysmally poor in. Um, and for those who relapse after multiple prior therapies for CLL, their disease is just more resistant. We absolutely need clinical trials and new drugs because our typical lymphoma regimens do not do well. Although there's now anecdotal data that some of these folks with the B-cell receptor agent, some of these folks may get some combinations in B-cell receptors or PD-1 um, and actually be salvaged. So, so certainly it is a problem that we face for, for the person who asked about the Richters. Now, with regards to testing, I realize there's a bias between countries <laughs> and finances. And I'm not saying we do it well, because we don't <laughs> either. Um, I think we're biased and spoiled. And so in the US, we, although I have to tell you, one of our big beefs in the US is that we don't do more testing. Um, although she appropriately said that, well, we have to really figure out how to do this, not only with our finances about how to pay for the testing, but also the drugs we need to treat you all with. This is a huge consideration, not just in the US and Canada, but obviously globally, and we have to figure out how to do this well. And so, you know, 17P deletion is obviously not very common at diagnosis, it's only about 6%. So we're not expecting that most patients who are diagnosed with CLL have a 17P. Okay, so let's just take that off the table so most of you are relieved. It actually increases in frequency. The more people have gotten treatment over time, the more beaten up we've, we've created with certain treatments. And there's no doubt that the frequency increases to about 30 to 40% of the patient population. And for sure, yes, do I agree? And I think I subtly said that before, is that certainly if you don't get it as baseline testing, you absolutely should get these tests done prior to initiating therapy. Because there's no, there's no doubt in my mind that you, know, you have to get a novel agent, and I'm not talking just a brute nib, but the novel agents are what you should be receiving if you have a 17P deletion. Um, there are the uh, upfront studies that are looking whether or not FCR versus a brute nib versus other therapies are better if you start those therapies, whether you're young and fit or older and older <laughs> and less fit, um, are closed. These are intergroup and cooperative group studies. They are closed, but we need the long-term data. Okay, so that question about whether FCR is appropriate versus a brutinib therapy uh, as frontline therapy is close to accrual, and hopefully we get long-term data to show whether or not one is more of an advantage over another. And I do think, and I'll talk about this later in my presentation, there are subsets that need to be considered, um, and I do think that there are less folks getting FCR, and we can talk about that as well, uh, because of some of the reasons that were brought up. Does that answer somebody's question? Thanks so much uh, uh, to, to both of you for um, uh, uh, a great question. Thank you.